Coming up on Market to Market. Indictments handed down over price collusion in the poultry industry. Ethanol production gets back to the grind as demand returns. And market analysis with John Roach. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com. This is the Friday, June 5 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. A major jolt in a key government report issued Friday morning. More Americans are headed back to work, and some employers are even adding to their workforces. According to the Labor Department, more than 2.5 million jobs were added in May, which would signal the end of what will likely be called a recession. The unemployment rate also fell to 13.3%, a drop of nearly a point and a half from last month, and almost six points lower, lower than predicted by private industry. Farmer sentiment is also on the rise in Purdue's Ag Economy Barometer. The latest reading was up seven points from April, but still off the record high set in February. United States imports and exports were down last month, but the trade deficit still grew in April as commerce with other countries was smothered by the coronavirus. Meat companies are still shipping beef, pork, and chicken overseas while dealing with plant closings during the pandemic. But a new challenge emerged this week as charges of collusion were handed down against a major poultry producer's employees. John Torpy leads off our coverage. This week, the U.S. Justice Department handed down an indictment to one of the nation's top poultry producers. The legal action comes at a time when the beef and pork industries also were tangled up in investigations. Four executives with Colorado-based poultry producer Pilgrim's Pride were indicted on one count of price fixing that occurred over a five-year time span. Georgia-based Claxon Poultry was also named in the indictment. Officials with the U.S. Justice Department claim that between 2012 and 2017, current and former executives with both companies conspired to fix prices and rig bids on broiler chickens. Pilgrim's Pride is owned by the Brazilian company JBS and supplies chickens to restaurants and grocery stores worldwide. Pilgrim's Pride did not respond to several requests by Market to Market for a comment on the case. Currently, there are 40 price-fixing lawsuits being litigated across the country. The lawsuit against the poultry giant comes at a time when other sectors of large-scale meat production are under legal scrutiny. In March of this year, members of Congress sent letters to the Justice Department asking for an investigation into price manipulation by the meatpacking industry. Ranchers and producers claim the meat packers are paying a lower price for live cattle while charging wholesalers significantly higher prices for box beef cutouts. The onset of COVID-19 only made matters worse, as packing plants were forced to temporarily close due to workers infected with the coronavirus. This led to a smaller beef supply just as a spike in demand hit grocery stores, resulting in even higher prices for consumers. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the U.S. city average price for a pound of ground beef in April has climbed almost 9% from a year ago. Pork processors are facing similar difficulties related to COVID-19. The virus has cut the workforce at several plants, causing scheduled deliveries of hogs to be turned away. 
As new litters arrive in the farrowing houses, several farms are being forced to euthanize their feeder pigs over concern there will be no place to process the animals when they are ready for market. Federal assistance for livestock producers is helping ease some of the financial burden brought on by low market prices due to the coronavirus. For nearly two weeks, cattle and hog producers have been able to apply for direct support via the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. According to USDA, applications for a portion of the $16 billion relief package can be made until August 28. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. A federal appeals court overturned a federal agency's approval of a chemical used on tens of millions of acres. The decision comes as farmers are ratcheting up spraying on an emerging crop and now will have one less tool in the toolbox moving forward. Josh Bittner reports. The Environmental Protection Agency's approval of the chemical dicamba was struck down this week by a federal appeals court. Dicamba is widely used in cotton and soybean acres and first gained approval in 2016 for a two-year license on a new version designed for genetically modified crops. The Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals said in their ruling, quote, the toxicity is not limited to weeds. The chemical has been at the center of disagreements between landowners that ended in an Arkansas farmer's murder back in 2016. The appeals court said EPA overstated the protections and understated or ignored environmental and economic risks. In 2017, hundreds of growers in multiple states reported problems with dicamba damaging nearby non-target fields. Monsanto, one of the companies with a new formulation of dicamba designed to be less prone to volatization, turning from liquid to vapor, said it investigated about 1,200 complaints and believe 80% of the problems occurred when farmers or other applicators failed to follow existing label requirements. In response to concerns, the Environmental Protection Agency did toughen labeling requirements in October of that year. At that time, those who planned to apply the reformulated chemicals were required to take more training. North Carolina producer Joe Gardner told Market to Market in 2018 he immediately knew something had gone wrong when he walked into one of his tobacco fields that year. The unnatural cupping on the leaves was similar to curling he had seen during the summer, after which he received a settlement for crop damage due to suspected dicamba exposure. But this time, almost 100 acres, nearly a third of his tobacco crop, showed signs of exposure. And I saw it that Monday, that Monday night. I ain't hardly slip a wink, not knowing what, what I was going to lose if I couldn't settle with somebody. The agribusiness giant still faces several lawsuits related to its dicamba herbicide. In 2017, drift during application damaged more than 3.6 million acres of soybeans and other crops in 25 states. Bayer, the now parent company of Monsanto, criticized the ruling but there has been no indication if the verdict will be appealed. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. OPEC countries floated the idea of extending production cuts aimed at boosting the price of crude oil. The talk helped add legs to the commodities move higher and also gave encouragement to another market tied to black gold, ethanol. As renewable fuel producers try to rebound from a dismal spring, the grind has picked up for the homegrown industry. Peter Tubbs has our coverage. As American ethanol plants come back online, producers may find a steep grade slowing their return to pre-pandemic production levels. Restarting the 35% of ethanol production that is still idled will require the American consumer returning to their 2019 driving habits. But changing work routines could be a long-term drag on gasoline sales. Dan Brazi is a consultant with Ag Resource, a Chicago, Illinois-based financial risk management company. If America changed its driving habits because of homestay, there's a lot of corporations in my town in Chicago where people are going to continue working from home. They won't make that commute into Chicago. Uh, that's something that will longer term have a structural impact on U.S. energy consumption, which thereby affects ethanol consumption. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, 
gasoline consumption peaked in the summer of 2016 and was down 8% before the economy was upended by COVID-19 lockdowns. Reduced driving may also affect the math of the renewable fuel standard. But as we think of ethanol, you know, the U.S. ethanol mandates that are set each year by the EPA are directed upon miles driven in America. So if we Americans drive fewer miles, the 15 billion gallon mandate will come down. Returning ethanol production to its 16 billion gallon peak will require an increase in exports. While export volumes rose from 10 million barrels to 40 million barrels between 2010 and 2018, exports represent less than 10 percent of U.S. ethanol production. I, I think uh, residual production, as I call it, stuff that's not used domestically, will have to be exported. Slow growth in ethanol production will be welcomed by the corn market, but a healthy corn crop will increase stocks and potentially depress prices. Well, I, I, I think the farmer needs to think forward. I, I mean, as we look at where corn prices and soybean and wheat prices are today, you know, I hate to say it, but there's still more downside risk, even with the ethanol industry in this recovery mode. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Next, the Market to Market Report. A weaker U.S. dollar pushed many commodities higher at week's end, highlighting a spread with the real. For the week, July wheat lost six cents, while the nearby corn contract gained six cents. Some technical buying following strength in corn pushed the soy complex higher as optimism forms over Chinese buying. The July soybean contract increased 27 cents. July soybean meal improved 5.90 per ton. July cotton jumped 420 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, June class three milk futures added $1.35. A down week in the livestock sector. August cattle dropped 342. August feeders declined 117. And the July lean hog contract fell $3.10. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index weakened 150 ticks. July crude was up again, this time by 457 per barrel. COMEX Gold dropped 61.40 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index increased 24 points to finish at 324.40. Joining us now to give us some insight is our senior market analyst, John Roach. John, good to see you. Thanks, Paul. Nice to be here. Good to be here talking on, as you said yesterday, an up week. Let's start with wheat, which didn't have a great Friday, but prior to that, it's been rallying a little bit. You had Kansas City kind of coming through to, to lead the complex. What's in play with wheat right now? Well, the wheat market um, uh, has uh, bounced uh, up toward the upper side of kind of its trading range, but then today got hammered right back down. It's harvest time. Uh, the combines are rolling, and uh, and in general, yields are not so bad. And uh, and so we're running into that harvest pressure. Although we think that we might have made the harvest low already, uh, the market uh, came back under pressure today. So you have harvest going on. You have a crop that's been a little slow to get in. You have a feed grain all of a sudden that has become uh, a scarce commodity. Now, rice had been rising prior to today. Is there any carryover to what's happening in the rice market to wheat? I think there's a mentality that you have to think about. If you're, if you're concerned about supply chain management, which is something we all became real concerned about when we realized how dependent we were, think about the people around the world that are dependent upon food supply chain. And so when they look at the, in the Asia, the number one food is rice. And when they see what the rice market has done, uh, uh, you have to look over to the other foods and say, well, these are cheap. And if you're going to buy wheat uh, because it's cheap and you want to stockpile, uh, you want to buy it at harvest time. And so we think there will be pretty good demand coming at this week. There has been good demand. We think it will continue to be good. We also think that maybe the black sea crop was not quite as big as they thought. We had some problems in Europe as well. So we just think that that probably the first thing to think about with all these markets is that we had a real drastic low here in April. And uh, and that was caused by a, a, a confluence of events coming together that are some of the most negative market type of events that we can imagine. But since that low, we've had markets basically 
turning around and moving higher, stabilizing or moving higher. And the people who have made money over the last, just look in the last two to three months, are the people who took the approach that everything's going to be okay. The people who went back to the stock market, the people who went to the gold market, the people who went to the energy markets, I mean, the people who've made money in recent weeks have been the people who've been positive about the future potential. All right. Well, in corn, if you're positive, you look at oil rising on the week. You've got some technical news. You've got some fundamental news. Which do you think is winning out right now in the corn market, John? I think it's going to be more technical. Uh, what we have is the, uh, uh, the spec funds uh, having amassed a very large short position. We just saw the numbers for uh, this last week through Tuesday. Uh, they had added another 6,000 contracts to their net short position. So this is this is the second largest net short behind the net short position they had last year, which fueled the big run up which was helped by weather. But the buyers for the big run-up last year were the spec funds, the same people who were loaded up on the short side of the boat. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, John. We, we got them where we want them. <laughs> you, you talked about the boat. I've, I've heard you mention this. So are we completely going from one side to the other and we're going to have a problem on the other end? Or are we balancing that boat right now? The fundamentals would suggest no, we're not going to go from big surpluses to shortages, but we're going to go from surpluses that we didn't know how we could end them to being, okay, now we can see an end. People aren't afraid to go out, at least a lot of people aren't afraid to go out, and so we're starting to see people drive more, we're seeing the ethanol, ethanol demand come back, energy prices have come back, and so this, this whole worry that we had two months ago is being replaced with, well, this is a little better than we thought. I mean, there's an unrest and there's all those other issues out there, but but it, we're actually coming, we're doing a little better here than what we thought, certainly in the in the situation with the equities. Uh, and, and in the case of China, they're still buying. Right. Real quick, um, are you selling more old crop corn right now or new crop corn? We're not selling either at the moment, but we think we'll have a sell signal next week. We did trigger the first day of a soybean sell signal today. All right. Well, the soybeans, why why did you trig trigger the sell signal today? We finally pushed the market far enough that it tilted. Uh, it's like a teeter-totter, you know, and, and once you finally get it over the hump and it tip, tips and goes the other way, uh, then you look for spots to be making sales, and that's where we're at. We're, we'll be averaging sales over this next week. All right. Well, we have a question um, a little bit. Also, what's playing in that teeter-totter effect is some of the global story that's going on. We always are talking about China, but there's a story developing out of Brazil with its currency. Dale in Illinois is asking you, John, do you think the modest rebound in the real is signaling a shift in trend or simply a short-term bounce in an ongoing decline? Too soon to tell. Uh, the, the situation in Brazil, the, the decline in the real was, was unbelievable. I mean, we've seen, well, maybe maybe people have seen it before, but I don't remember seeing anything quite like that. And so how much recovery can we have back? It could be a lot. Or it could be the, the real will come back under pressure because of the COVID problem that they're having there. I don't know. It, it, it's just too soon to tell. And so at the moment, I wouldn't say the real is ready to go substantially stronger because I think they've got too much uncertainty there right now. And so if you put a gun to my head, I'd say, I think it should sag back a little bit. But bear in mind, it became very, very cheap. It was way too cheap. And so what springs one way has got to spring back. How quick is that spring back looking to happen? Well, we had a pretty good spring back already. I mean, it's bounced a lot in just a period of a couple of weeks. And so we could ease back a little bit and still not make a new low but we could ease back a little because we're going to have to get some stability here and some confidence. And maybe that's ready to happen in Brazil, but I don't see it just yet. All right, what, so they, they, they're just making the news as they're coming up the ladder on this COVID situation. And it's pretty scary. All right. Are you concerned uh, from a Brazilian standpoint? I guess concern is probably not the right word. Is Brazil in jeopardy of running out of soybeans and they're going to have to turn to the United States? Possibly. I'm not sure that I would say that yet. But I think they, that they could get their, themselves in that situation on corn. Uh, I think this corn crop has been hurt, the second corn crop down there that they're in the process of just beginning to harvest now. Um, I think we've had some losses there. All um, right. 
But what I but what I do think is they have sold very heavily. Farmers in Brazil, because of the currency relationship, they received extremely high prices, and they sold about as heavy as they could sell, uh, as as heavy as they could be comfortable. How long is this sell signal? What's your guess on on beans right now? You got five days in it, four days? Now, well, we had uh, we've had seven of them in the last twelve months, and they ran from five to twelve. Okay, and so. Uh, and so the way the market's positioned here right now, there's a lot of farmers with a lot of inventory. I think it's, we're going to struggle to 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 move higher um, uh, all next week, I would think. I think the market will find a peak, uh, and it'll be made with farmer sales. All right, cotton-wise, we don't normally ask you about cotton, John, but that's up 7% this week. Is this all China-related, or is are we having problems getting the crop in the ground? Uh, a little bit of that, but more problem with uh, more China related. I mean, remember, China is the largest importer and exporter of, of cotton and textiles. And so it's uh, uh, they they control the, the uh, uh, really the, the world demand on that. And, and again, the, the approach that has been that's made most sense here recently is to take a positive approach to the markets that that things are going to be OK. We're going to get our way. We'll get through this process here, uh, and uh, uh, and I think that's the same situation we're seeing in cotton. I mean, it's it's pushing right up on its highs for this move. All right, the cattle market uh, down across the complex this week. You have some production getting higher back up to what it was not three months ago, but in a little more consistent measure. We're looking at a possible. Uh, is this all U.S. demand? Is this, I hate to sound like a broken record, back to Brazil, filling a void? Is there something globally that the American farmer is producing here, especially when it comes to beef? Well, the, the biggest problem with the beef situation right now is that the farmers still have animals that should have been slaughtered before. And they're all heavier weights. Uh, our slaughter uh, weights are all running above where they were a year ago. And... Uh, uh, we've got a June uh, uh, futures uh, headed into delivery, and uh, and it's scared to death of where the cash market might be. Um, so we're just struggling here. The dressed beef was in, under pressure. Um, we're struggling to uh, to get demand back normalized. I mean, we're 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 not at normal, uh, but we're headed toward normal. How fast we get there, I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. But so far, it's happening a little quicker than people thought, not slower. And so, but that's what's necessary. We've got to get back to normal uh, in the supply chain. Well, I can tell you, going to the grocery store, I have seen that ground beef price go up week after week after week. At some point, the consumer might just cry uncle and maybe balance some of this out. Feeder-wise, John, uh, you talk about these heavy animals that are out there. We've got a feeder situation because a lot of feeders have been pulled back. Do you see a big problem come August, September, October in the feeder cattle market? No, I don't. I think that we'll be out from underneath most of the issue that we're dealing with here, and I think that we'll be back in business. All right. Uh, what do you see going forward feeder-wise uh, here in the next week then? Well, we need to, we need to hold a dollar thirty on the uh, on the futures. I mean, that's where the that's where the support is. Uh, we've gotten up above it. If we can hold that, we're doing just fine. If not, we may have to back off and try it one more time as we're getting this fat cattle market straightened out. All right, the hog market also one of those products that's down five percent again this week. All of a sudden, what peaked in as you'll see here on the chart late April has dropped off in May. Does this thing? We've almost touched our March-April lows. Are we going back to that same territory? I don't think so. I think our numbers will, will uh, become smaller as we move out forward. Uh, we actually have a four-box buy signal on hogs. So we think this market is down at a bottom spot here. Uh, and if you're a hedger, we'd be patient and wait for some recovery. All right. Well, you have still huge exports to China January through April. Will that continue? I think so. I think that what China has told us all along is although we're arguing about some things where, I mean, they still need our food. We are their supply chain, and, and I think their biggest concern is if they were to run short of food at the same time they're having some of these other issues. And so I think they're in the market, and I, I think that they don't want to buy from us if they can avoid it, but they really can't. And, and I think that their phase one uh, 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 agreement, um, I think they're going to try to honor it. I mean, and we're way below where we need to be, but 
few more weeks like this and it'll, and, and it'll fix itself. And it becomes a little bit of an economic versus a political discussion and, and sometimes the economy wins. John Roach will talk about dairy and the dollar in Market Plus. Thank you, John. Good to see you. Thanks, Paul. All right, that will do it for the insight from John Roach and the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but there's still a whole lot more to talk about. We'll cover it in Market Plus, where we'll answer more of your questions. You can find it on the web at markettomarket.org. It has turned to hay season for many producers, and we found a few of the majestic images of the cutting and baling, and we've posted them on our Instagram feed of at Market to Market Show. Check them out. Join us next week when we'll look at the return of a crop to a state for the first time in decades. Thank you so very much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com.